Hello, Renew Church. Happy Father's Day. I'm Gerald Tarsicius, and this is my beautiful wife, Julia. Um, we are not a part of the regular speaking crew here, so there's a good chance a lot of you don't know us. Actually, what you don't know is that behind the scenes, we edit and approve all messages here at Renew. <laughs> She's just kidding. So by way of introduction, um, I've been a part of the Renew family since 2001. I started here when the Medivale campus was called Grace. And then in 2006, I joined a small team of people as we started the Village Church in Milton. In 2009, Julia and I met on eHarmony, an online dating site. And in 2010, we were married. Um, we have lived in Milton ever since, and we just celebrated our 11-year anniversary last week. We also have three children, a nine-year-old boy and two girls, five and three years old. And here's a picture of the three of them in India. Uh, about a year and a half ago, just before COVID happened. And if you were wondering what we were doing in India, we were there to adopt our third child, Prita. Funny story. When we were in India, we needed a particular paperwork, an exit visa, to get out of the country. We had already experienced typos in our important documents so far in the adoption process. We had, we had a return flight booked already, so we really, really needed the right paperwork. We had given ourselves extra time in India for any problems that arose because we knew they could. Of course, our exit visa had someone's name spelled wrong, even though we triple-checked our spelling on the online form. So we contacted the office that made the typo and prayed they would correct it in time. But what does any good Christian do in times like these? They use their Photoshop skills to fix the mistake. So Gerald went to work fixing the original document with Photoshop on his computer to make sure the name matched the passport, and we prayed it wouldn't be an issue trying to leave. Thankfully, the day before the flight, the proper paperwork came in, so we didn't need to test our skills. But sometimes, as a dad, you need to do what you need to do to get your family home, including the occasional forgery. We did a lot of praying on that trip. I had always wanted to be an international identity forger, and I thought this would be my chance. Catch me if you can, India. <laughs> So for this Father's Day, we wanted to see what God says to men and really bless and encourage them. And specifically in our culture, fathers often have been given a bad rep. It's fashionable, especially in TV sitcoms, to portray dads as these ignorant baboons who are pretty useless, and it's the mom who always has to and can do everything. But the truth is, this may be funny, but it doesn't help. It doesn't help men aspire to be what they need to be in society and for their families. It doesn't help Christian men aspire to the level of godliness that God has designed for them. But thankfully in scripture, we have a resource that paints a beautiful picture of what godly biblical fatherhood really is. And before Julia jumps into the first point in our message this morning, I want to take a couple of minutes to paint a big picture of what biblical fatherhood is. Now, God has designed and appointed fathers to love, serve, and sacrifice for those entrusted to our care. When we do this well, we reflect God's heart. We reflect the heart of God, who also happens to be our Heavenly Father. And at a base level, it starts with our responsibilities to our earthly children those that God has entrusted to our care, and we have a direct responsibility for raising. But there is really more to this. I think the real heart of God is that fatherhood is not just earthly, but ultimately spiritual. The real heart of godly fatherhood is raising those who are entrusted to our care in such a way that they, they are pointed to a God who cares for them and who wants them to be a part of a bigger family, the family of God. The real heart of godly fatherhood is spiritual fatherhood, and what this means then is that it doesn't matter if you happen to be an earthly father or not. Every man, regardless of whether he has earthly children or not, has a responsibility and the privilege to be a spiritual father, to be a spiritual parent, to be a spiritual guardian to those who are younger than him in the faith that God has placed around him in a circle of influence and entrusted to his care. For many of us, that starts with our earthly children. But for every one of us, it goes beyond that. What God is knitting and forming and shaping is a family of people who have been redeemed by Jesus and who call God our Father. And in that economy, our earthly definitions are thrown out the window and we have something bigger and deeper and profound to take hold of. And on that note, let's dive in and take a look at this passage from Paul to the Corinthians. It's a passage that talks about our identity as Christians and how we are to conduct ourselves in this world. 
We are going to focus on one part of it, but we wanted to read a bigger section to give you some context to this. For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's found in 2 Corinthians. In the last part of the passage, God says he will be a father, and we will be his sons and daughters. We see a beautiful picture of how God sees us as human beings. And we want to speak more specifically to men and dads today and see what being God's sons means for them. God looks at men, his very sons, with grace. The whole Bible is basically one big book of God, viewing humans with grace and reaching toward them with grace. Men, dads, fathers, we want you to know that when God sees you, he sees you with grace, with genuine happiness. He sees the man who fumbles and fails every day and still sees him with happiness and a smile on his face. He sees the man who's working on his marriage and maybe even failing at his marriage and still sees him with genuine love and compassion as his son. He sees the dad who works hard to provide for his family and his face smiles. He sees the workaholic and he's empathetic. He sees the man who can't work for various reasons and his heart breaks. He sees the man who loves playing with his kids and the man who's maybe failed with his kids and on both of them, his face shines. And we might look at this and wonder, how is this even possible? How does God look at every man, every father, in every situation so equally? It seems so unfair and that is exactly the point. God is an unfair God. When it comes to access to his love and goodness, his wisdom and courage, his peace and his grace, God is an unfair God who gives us these gifts abundantly. We don't have to earn these things. He gives it to us freely. And that is exactly why he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, so that we would have unfettered, unconditional access to God. Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, as recorded in Luke 15 who after squandering his inheritance, decides to return home, hoping to be a servant. But when he was a long way off, his father saw him and ran to him and gave him a place of honor. He didn't shame him or condemn him. He welcomed him with open arms. And Jesus wanted to paint a picture of what turning back to God looks like. He is a gracious and giving father. And so to men, dads, fathers, we want to say today that God has given you unconditional access to himself. In your success and your failures, in your striving and your failing, on your good days and on your bad days, God is unrelenting in his pursuit of you and how he sees you. As you mentioned earlier, we adopted our third child from India. And while a lot of her story will be hers to tell someday, I wanted to share from our perspective what that process was like. I know with head knowledge that God has adopted me into his family after I turned to Christ. But it wasn't until we traveled across the world to bring our daughter home that it became heart knowledge. We were so excited to meet her after we had endured a four-year process of waiting to be in that moment. We walked into her home and we were nervous, excited, scared, so many feelings all mixed up. We sat down with the, wor the social worker of the home and signed paperwork that meant we were her legal parents. This was it. Even though we had passed court, this made it official. We were her new mom and dad, and our joy was palpable. She, on the other hand, knew only of India and the home she lived in, the children and workers she interacted with each day. She didn't know what it meant to be a part of a family. And so she was terrified of us, this strange group of people. She cried whenever Gerald particularly came near her. She definitely would not let him hold her. Even though he loved her so much, it was not yet a part of her identity. Her big change day occurred, the day she came with us, and it was one of the hardest days of her little life. As time went on, Gerald would do all the right attachment things we had learned. He didn't force himself on her. He let her come to him on her own terms. And as she embraced her new identity as his daughter, she blossomed into a fun, bubbly, hilarious little girl full of love for others. And now Gerald is her preferred parent. This picture showed me how much God pursues us and loves us. And even when we reject him, his love doesn't change. Even when we don't live like his sons and daughters, he is still our parent. He is so patient. He waits for us to come to him. He is a safe and perfect parent. And he longs to parent us. 
And when we embrace our identity as his child and really let that seep in, we become who God created us to be. We love others more. We can rest and play. We can use our God-given gifts to love our families and the church and our neighbors. How much God loves us that he was willing to send his son into our world to be rejected and scorned so that we may know and love him. Our identity, whose we are, should shape how we live. We can't simply do things for God and hope that he will love us. Rather, we are adopted and loved, and it is out of that that we do. I think if Christians started living out of our identities, we would be more joyful and more people would want to be a part of this Jesus-following family. Dads, you get to show your kids God's love when you love them, when you show up for them. When you trust God, they learn to trust God. When you take steps of faith and see what a good God he is, your children see. You can encourage your children to live out their identities in Christ as you live out yours. I hope you see that, Ben. And I hope you take a moment to just kind of let that sink in. Now, we've seen up to this point a bit of a summary of our identity as men, but um, especially our identity as God sees us. And to be honest, that might actually be new for some of us, that despite our brokenness, our shame, our weaknesses, God still sees us as a dad would see their child on even their worst day with joy and gladness and happiness. And as we saw, it is because he felt so strongly for us that he sent Jesus to die for us. That's our identity. We are men who've been loved and cared for and sacrificed for. And out of this love, and care and sacrifice that has been abundantly poured out on us, there are also implications of that identity. And while this could be taken in a lot of different directions today, I want to, to look at it from one specific angle that I think a lot of men struggle with. You know, I do. And, and hopefully, we can all resonate with this. Now, we are going to start by reading a verse written by Paul to Timothy. Train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. What Paul is doing here is contrasting physical training with godly training. By godly training, he's not referring to some mystical training that makes us more holy or more loved by God. Because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, we're already holy, we're already loved. But by using these terms, physical and godly, he's referring to the purpose of your training. And even the, tra the word that, that, is the, that he uses for training is gymnazo, the word that we get gymnasium from. And it's very much that sense of training and discipline that's coming through here. That this is the kind of training that might take some work and some effort. The purpose of physical training in general is to train us to function, to survive, and even thrive in this world by the world's standards. And that's an important distinction because godly training is conforming to a different set of standards. And in its proper place, there doesn't have to be anything wrong with it. Even Paul says that physical training has some value. Physical training might involve things like pursuing a certain kind of education to do a certain kind of job. It might involve learning new skills for a certain career progression. It might involve working out in the gym or in an athletic facility, working on our actual bodily physical skills. It might involve other activities that we pursue and sometimes even at a high level in the arts or in music, for instance. And as you can see, there's nothing inherently wrong with a lot of these. You know, As a family, we've been engaged in some of these things in different seasons of our lives with schooling, music, and sports. You know, there is physical training that is a part of our lives that we just can't get away from and arguably that we actually need. But godly training, on the other hand, prepares us for a very different purpose. It prepares us to do what God wants from us. It prepares us to follow Jesus, to love God, to love others, to live sacrificially and selflessly. It prepares us to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile. It prepares us to always have a reason for the hope that we have. It prepares us to forgive. It prepares us to demonstrate a real faith, both by the way we live and by the words we speak. Physical training can't help you do any of this. But because godly training focuses on what God wants from us, it's the only kind of training that ultimately teaches us and trains us to truly flourish as human beings. And as the verse says, godly training has promise for both the present life and the life to come, something physical training cannot even touch. 
the reason I wanted to talk about this today is that my experience as a dad, personally, and also in watching other dads around me, is that when it comes to our kids, the temptation is very strong to emphasize physical training to the detriment of godly training. I struggle with this, guys. I get it. I want my kids to do well academically, athletically, musically, artistically, and in whatever other interests we may have. But I think Jesus was quite perceptive when he said, what good is it when we gain the whole world but lose our soul? I'm very convinced and convicted that my number one role as a dad is to prepare my children to follow God because it has promised for this world and the world to come. My number one role as a dad is to make sure they don't lose their soul to the world. Within a godly training lifestyle, physical training would have its place, but ultimately physical training is submitted and yielded to what God would want from us. The currents of our culture are stronger than ever. And as Christians, as we live in an ever more marginalized place in society, it is important for our kids to know that God's standards and the world's standards are often completely opposed to each other. Now, we'll get to some concrete steps in a minute. But first, I wanted to ask a few diagnostic questions and help us really see what we're doing for kids as parents. So remember, you know, God loves you and God is not up there frowning at you. We've already covered that. But he's also given us very clear commands on pursuing godly training, both for ourselves and for those he's entrusted to our care. So here are some questions. Now, according to your kids, what would they say is the general focus of the training in their lives? I'm not asking how you would answer the question, because I think it's easy for us as Christian parents to often kind of baptize or justify everything simply because we happen to go to church on Sunday morning. But what would your kids say? Now, what's the general focus of the training that you're overseeing and providing for them? Dads, answer this question honestly, because your kids depend on you to do the right thing. Next question. Where would your kids say they get their identity? Are they primarily being shaped towards an identity in which they are citizens of God's kingdom or citizens of this world? This is also a really important question to ask. Now, are they being shaped to be children of God, redeemed by Jesus, or are they being shaped to be merely citizens of this world? High-functioning citizens, perhaps, but still merely citizens of this world. And the related question would be, what ultimately drives and controls your family's calendar? Is it godly training, or is it physical training? You know, practically speaking, what's immovable on your calendar, and what's allowed to shift or even drop off because the other one has priority? Now, this may be the most important question here today because it sets the tone and posture of your family. We do need to remember that it's not that important to, to get the proportion just right when it comes to godly training and physical training. You know, so, for instance, we're not saying that for every hour of physical training, you have to have an hour of godly training. Not only would that be unrealistic, but it would be legalistic. What we are trying hard to do is get to the heart of the matter. And the heart of this is, does godly training have a central place in your family's life? Is it immovable, or is it the thing you might get to if you've got nothing else on the calendar? Now, we're coming up on the summer months, and to be honest, summer is not the best time to pick up new routines, because it is such an unscheduled time for a lot of us. But the fall is also just around the corner, and it's a new season and it's a new year for school, for church, and a great time to begin to cultivate some new routines. Men, dads, I want to encourage you to make your kids' godly training a priority. God has saved you. God has redeemed you. God has called you. And I want to encourage you to pray long and hard and respond to God's call on your lives as dads. As I said, your kids' very lives, their very souls depend on the decisions that you make as a dad. And that isn't meant to be a guilt trip or put unnecessary pressure on us. You know, we all have enough of that already. Instead, it's actually meant to free us up, to open us up to the possibilities that God has for us. God wants your kids to flourish, both in his kingdom and in this world, more than we do, in fact. He, more, he wants it more than we do, but he also wants it done his way. And what Paul said to Timothy and what God continues to say to us today is that the only thing that has promise for both the present life and the life to come is godliness and godly training. So with that in mind, here are just a few ideas. First, 
learn to read the Bible together as a family. You know, every night as a family, we have a routine of reading Scripture, praying, and singing together. Now, this doesn't have to take a long time. Often, what we're reading is just a few verses or a short passage. You know, we pray briefly about one or two things going on around us, and then we might just sing the chorus of a song the kids like. And lots of times, this can look pretty chaotic with three young children. But most nights, we just stay the course and do something, even if it's messy, because that teaches them that these are an important part of our identity. It's the godly training we're trying to impart. Secondly, figure out how to create margin in your lives for everyone in your family. Now, try not to spread yourself so thin with physical training that you miss the opportunities for godly training. Now, really pray about what activities and events could be traded off so that your kids can benefit from other things. Now, here at Sunday School, we've got things like Maverick Youth, Sunday School, Life Cycle classes. Now, I know Sunday School doesn't happen as much with COVID, but it'll start up again as we get back into normal. Now, create margin in your lives so that you and your family can take advantage of these opportunities. These are some great avenues for godly training for your families. And finally, as you create margin, think about how you and your family could be blessed with some godly training within our Renew groups. Our Renew groups are the way for God's people to live out Jesus with each other and live out Jesus in our communities. The people your family spends the most time with are going to have the greatest impact in shaping the identity of your kids. Renew groups are a wonderful opportunity for you and your kids to really learn what it means to live out our identity as a family of missionary servants, something that at Renew we consider central to our identity as Jesus followers. Ultimately, your kids need to see you modeling the very things that you believe to be true. And the reality is that what you actually do is what ultimately tells your kids what you actually believe. And I think of Olympic athletes like Usain Bolt or Donovan Bailey or Michael Phelps and how they train for years for their shot at a gold medal. Their pursuit of a win and their sport becomes their identity. They train their bodies and spend hours of time and invest a ton of energy and money to be the best in their sport. But what if we took godly spiritual training with that seriousness? What if we knew and loved God the way athletes knew and loved their sport? And what if we sought healing from past hurts or rejections or traumas so that we could show up in a whole new way for our families? A book called Try Softer by Andy Kolber, who's a Christian counselor, is all about how God designed our brains to find connection and joy. She says, as we engage in our own deep emotional work, we love each other in the most alive, empathic ways. We do not see the people in front of us as tasks or obligations. They are the imago Dei, and we see and feel with them. Isn't this what we long for, to be loved and to be seen? Men, you each have your own story you are processing, your own past and hurts. And sometimes it may take professional help with a counselor to start healing so that you can accept God's love and love your family the way you want to. We wanted to just say, there's absolutely no shame in that. There is so much strength and bravery in asking for help. And there is so much hope available. For the last few weeks, Pastor Andrew has been leading a men's marriage cohort and he had about 15 men, including Gerald, who were a part of this. They met once a week on Zoom for an hour and shared what was going on in their lives. I know Gerald found it encouraging and helpful to be able to be honest with a small group of men about his struggles in life, and he was also able to be an encouragement to others. Often, we need others to help us grow. Another quote from Try Softer that I like is, when people begin to understand that change happens in layers and is rarely linear, it's as if someone took a grueling weight off them. They stand a bit straighter. Often they become a touch kinder to themselves and others. It's as if someone put a bomb on their souls and gave them this message. It takes as long as it takes. It's okay to be unfinished. It's absolutely normal to be imperfect. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Change is slow and often takes time. For it is God who works in us to help us grow. There's a great verse in Ephesians that speaks to the kind of hope that we can have when we are going through the trials and the drudgery of life. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. God is a patient God who has not left us as orphans. We have the Holy Spirit who lives in us. How amazing is that? 
God is a gracious Father who wants us to know and experience his love. May there be an upcoming generation of men who have healthy relationships with their fathers and with God because of the hard work their dads were willing to put in right now, because it's never too late to start. You may never know the impact you will have on this side of eternity, but it will be worth it. He is able to do so much more than we can ask or imagine, because that is the kind of God we serve. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this Father's Day, and we want to acknowledge that you really do love as only a child, as only a perfect father could. Thank you for what you're doing in our church and in the world. You know, we know there are people who may be struggling today for a variety of reasons, and we pray for your comfort on their lives. We also know there may be people who may be running away from you. Please, Father, keep chasing them down. And we know there may be people who need some encouragement. Please speak to their hearts. May each man listening today grow in their role as spiritual fathers as they lead and care for those you've entrusted to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day.